Okay, now, settle down. Let's lower those expectations. Uh, thank you. I love being here at Torrey Pines. As, as Guy mentioned, my name is Kevin McPeak. I'm one of the pastors in our church movement. I love this church. Torrey Pines is very meaningful to me. Um, I have so many dear friends that are here. If we've not met before, I'd love to say hello after the service. Uh, because this, this is just a great, it's a great church. It's a great place. Uh, the other day, I think it was Mingo said, um, Torrey Pines Church is a great Christmas church. And I think that's a really good description because this, this church does Christmas really well. I think it's like one of the best kept secrets in all of San Diego. It's like Christmas at Torrey Pines is a super fun thing to do. It's a super fun place to be. And, and Christmas here in Southern California is it is a little weird if, you're, if you didn't grow up here because, like, it's cold at night, but then it's warm during the day, so we don't get, like, the full wintry Christmas experience. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, I prefer this to actual snow. Uh, I grew up in a small town outside of Syracuse, New York. I've had more than my share of snow. Thank you very much. If you didn't know this already, this is a real fact. Syracuse, New York is the snowiest city in America by averages. Uh, it actually gets more snow than Anchorage, Alaska. My hometown, Syracuse, New York, uh, averages 127 inches of snow per year. That's more than 11 feet. It, well, actually, it's just under 11 feet because I'm not good at math. Um, and, and if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you a picture. This is actually what it looks like in my hometown at Christmas. Um, that's, not, I'm, that's not my hometown. That's actually uh, the, the TV special Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And some of you are old enough to remember that when that was on and you missed it, you had to wait 12 months to see it again. Because we didn't have like on demand and all the stuff that you soft kids have these days. <laughs> right? Like if you missed the Charlie Brown Christmas special when it was on, you're, you're waiting a full year until your opportunity to see it again. So like you, you had to like gear your schedule around that stuff. Uh, but but that, was, that was a really big deal. I, basically, bottom line of everything I've been saying the last couple of sentences, I'm really old. So anyway, going back to snow, we tend to think that snow is like the most magical thing in the world at Christmas time, right? We think that it looks like this, that this is the experience of snow, right? That you get like this experience that's gonna come up on the screen any moment now <laughs> that is it like this, right? Right? Just go outside. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> Come on, let's go and play. Right? You just want to sit out and sit by the window and look at the tree and sip hot cocoa and talk about Christmas. And, you know, like, it, 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 it's, it's nice. But, but when I grew up, like, the first snow was pretty, but honestly it looked more like this which is what snow uh, looks like in Syracuse when it, when it really happens. This, I am not making this up. That's a picture from Syracuse, New York. That's from my hometown. And you have to like shovel snow off of your car because it's so deep. Anywhere else in the country, we call that a blizzard. In Syracuse, we call that Tuesday. <laughs> and, and you just have to go on living. And, and here's the thing, like, the fr like I said, the first snow is nice, but then like, then it's, it's January, right? You get past Christmas, and it's like that. And then it's February. And then it's March. And then it's April, and there's still snow. And I'm not making this up. One year, it snowed on Mother's Day. That is the saddest I've ever seen my mother. <laughs> it's so bad. And it, just, and it just wears you out. And if you didn't grow up around this, you wouldn't know, but if you, if you did grow up around like snow, you know that it's, it's powdery white at first. But then it turns to like this dirty, gross, crunchy, dirt brown snow that looks kind of like, like this. Like this is what snow looks like in February. And this is the experience of winter in Syracuse, New York where I grew up. It's just dirt brown snow. If you, if you ever have read like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, that description of Narnia, it's always winter, but never Christmas. That was my childhood. It's just, it's so long. It feels like half the year is snow, and it wears on you. Like it just, it makes you so depressed because you feel like spring will never come. 
Like it's never, it's never going to arrive. And I remember as a kid feeling like that, right? Like, like winter's been going on forever. Spring is never going to come. This is why I now live in San Diego because uh, I, I just can't anymore with all of that. But I remember as a kid, every year there would be one day in the spring where you'd go out and you'd look in the yard and you would see this. And these, I don't know if you're familiar with these. These are called snowdrops. And they are, it, where I grew up, they're the earliest blooming flower. And they actually literally do this. They will actually bloom up through the snow. And it's an incredible thing when you see it. Not just because, oh my gosh, look at these, these flowers that are blooming through the snow. But it's a sign spring is coming. Like something good is on the way. My mom is in her 80s. And I promise you that every year, the first time she sees the snowdrops, she calls me. And she says, I, I, Kev, I saw, I saw the snowdrops today. Because it's a big deal. Because it means that after all of that winter that you've been through, after all of that waiting, after all that grind, after just trying to get through day after day after day after day, something good, in this case, spring, is on the way. Now, if you know the story of the people of Israel, especially as we get to the end of the Old Testament and, and right before the beginning of the New Testament where Jesus is born, the people of Israel have been waiting generations for the coming of the Messiah. Now, if you're new to church, you're new to Scripture, and I use this word Messiah, you might not know what that means. The Messiah, it, it basically it means the Savior, the Redeemer, the one, the one who's come to, like, to cure all of the problems in the world. And, and the Jewish people had been waiting hundreds of years, generation upon generation, for this promised Messiah to arrive. And it's a lot like that long winter. They're just waiting. And interestingly, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, there's a prophet, Isaiah. And Isaiah said, hey, I'm going to tell you what to look for so you know when you see this thing, you're going to know that the, the Messiah is on his way. He said this in Isaiah chapter 7, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now, what what Isaiah is doing in that verse is basically he's saying, hey, everybody, look for the snowdrop flowers. You've been waiting through winter, and then at some point, those flowers are going are gonna to pop up. And in this case, it's going to be this sign. This virgin will conceive a child. We will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Right? So he's not talking about literal flowers, but he's saying this thing that indicates the long wait is almost over. I want you to be aware of it. Because what's coming with the Messiah is so much better than spring. And, and, and in fact, two chapters later, what Isaiah does is he begins to describe all of the good things that the Messiah will bring, that he will represent, that he'll be responsible for. It says this in Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born. So he's referring to this Messiah that's going to come. Unto us a son is given. I, I just want to very quickly point out, because we zoom past that. Unto us a child is given. Don't miss the meaning of that. It's not just that a baby is born. A baby is born for us. He's given to us. It's not just the arrival of, of a child. It's our child. It's a hugely important thing. And then it says the government shall be upon his shoulder. These will be his royal titles. Wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. I want to pause for a second and, and focus on the last thing that Isaiah says. The Prince of Peace. And my guess is that peace might be the exact thing that a lot of us need today. Because for whatever reason, the Christmas season, like this, this time that's supposed to be about anticipating the arrival of this Prince of Peace, it does a great job of doing one particular thing, which is robbing us of our peace. Right? That's, it's just what, what happens, right? We commit to too many activities. We have too many expenses. We have too many gatherings. We have too many everything, right? So, so just life gets super busy, and that robs us of our peace. But then you know what's super great about the holidays? I don't know if you enjoy this as much as I do, but if you're experiencing, like, disappointment, pain, grief, loss, whatever, 
it like layers on top of all that and amplifies it. So that's fun, right? Because you, you just, you feel the pain of life much more deeply during the holiday season. I don't know if you've experienced that. I certainly have. And it's just, it's just this human nature thing that as we get close to the holidays, if we've experienced pain and loss, if we're walking through grief, we, we feel that like magnified. And, and by the way, if you're walking through that, first thing I want you to know is you are not alone and, and we, like we see you. And your grief matters. And you're going you're gonna to hear a great message next week about this, about this idea. But just know, like, that's a, that's a perfectly normal thing to happen. And God wants to be Emmanuel, God with you, in the middle of, of that grief and that pain that you're walking through. Because the truth is, this season of anticipating Jesus' birth, it's not supposed to be about the pain. But sometimes it is. And, and so what we need to do to experience this peace that the Prince of Peace is going to bring, we've, we've got to do some things. We've got to slow down. We've got to try to, to create opportunities to experience the presence of God. Now, I, I want to pause for a second and, and just talk a little bit about this idea of the presence of God. Because the, the, this, this concept, the presence of God, it's a big deal in the Bible. And I'm going to oversimplify a little bit here. I'm going to just super quick run through some theology um, to explain this idea. If you go to the Old Testament, okay, so the Old Testament, that's the, the portion of the Bible that's written before the birth of Jesus. If you go to the Old Testament, you'll see that the presence of God is generally connected to particular places. If you look in the book of Exodus, the, the presence of God exists within the tabernacle, and that's, that's a specific place that is with the people of Israel, and it's mobile. As they move, it goes with them. So God knows everything and sees everything, but his presence is connected to a specific location. Then later on, if you read about King David, King Solomon, they, they build a temple, and, and the presence of God resides in the temple. And instead of that being a mobile thing that moves with the people, that actually is a permanent place in Jerusalem. And so God is among the people in this city. So throughout the Old Testament, this idea of the presence of God tends to be like in, in fixed locations. But then there's this really incredible thing that happens in the New Testament. After, after Jesus comes, we, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the presence of God is all around us. It's not, it's not limited to one specific location. The presence of God is with us wherever we go. He is always there at all times in all places. We go back to this description from um, Isaiah chapter 7. Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us at all times in this, in this notion of the always present presence of God. Now, I want to give you an illustration that, that hopefully will we'll kind of clarify this a little bit. And, and I want you to do this. I just want you to look around the room a little bit. Just look around the room a little bit. Okay? This isn't a magic trick. This isn't like a David Blaine thing. Okay. There's a thing that is in the room surrounding all of us. It's, it's around you. It's beneath you. It's above you. It's on all sides. And it's effectively invisible to you. And that's air. Right? Air is all around all of us at all times. And air, unless you live in Los Angeles, is essentially invisible. <laughs> and the fact is, air is not nothingness. Air is actually full of all the gases, the, the oxygen, nitrogen, all of that, that support life, create the atmosphere, all of it. So air is always with us, right? As long as, as, long as we're sort of in the atmosphere, we're surrounded by air. But air is entirely neutral to our existence. Air is around us, but I don't think it would be fair to say that air is with us. I don't think it would be fair to say that air is for us. It is simply present. Now, God is very similar, except that God is around us, among us, within us, and is with us and for us. God has made a decision to not be a passive observer of your life. But God wishes to be an active, engaged participant in your life. 
God is with you and for you, going back to Isaiah 7, Emmanuel, God with us, the presence of God all around us, the presence of God with us, the presence of God for us. God is above us, below us, and even though he has the power to be remote, to be distant, that's not what he's chosen. He's chosen to be Emmanuel. He's chosen to be God with us. And, and during this season, what I want to encourage all of us, you and me, to do is to experience God's presence with us, among us, for us. And in the middle of what can be a, a really hectic season and sometimes a very painful and lonely season, I believe that experiencing God's presence makes an enormous difference, not just in how we experience the season, but how you and I really live our lives. And so with the time that we have today, I'm going to propose three simple ways that you and I can experience the presence of God in this season. This is the first one. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. It's make room for surrender. Well, okay, so when we talk about making room for surrender, what does that, what does that look like? What does that even mean? Well, on a, on a very basic level, it's the release of control. Surrender is symbolized by open hands. You'll notice a lot of times in worship, we're, we're lifting our arms or we'll put our hands out like this. Even if you're not comfortable with it, maybe you're new to church and you're wondering, you know, why do people have their hands up? Is somebody going to answer that question? It, that's not what's happening, right? It's an indication of surrender. God, I give control to you. I'm not in charge of my life. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a, a nugget of wisdom I stole from Mike Meeks, who's the pastor emeritus of our movement. And, and it's so spot on because what we, what we think control is, is, is like our ability to, to alter the course of events. But you know really what control is? Control is the opposite of faith. See, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is control. See, you, you can wrestle with your doubts. Just quick so you know, I'm a pastor. I've got lots of doubts. Doubts and faith can coexist. Actually, I think in many cases, doubts and faith very healthily coexist because I know the strength of my faith when I'm wrestling with the doubts. But when I really want to fly against my faith, what I do is I seize control. Because God, you know what? You probably don't have this one. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take, take control of this one. I'm going to take, take control of this issue. This thing that I'm really worried about, oh, God, I don't think you got that one. So what I think would be most profitable, the best use of my time, would be to, like, worry about it a lot. That's, that, I think that's going to move the ball forward. And ultimately, surrender isn't giving God control of stuff that wasn't in his control. It's us recognizing we're surrendering the thing that God had control of all along. That we were the variable, not God. We're the one that needs to change. Look at what it says in 1 Peter. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may, he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Don't miss that last set of words. It isn't just cast all your anxiety on him. Uh, he'll take care of it. He will. Why? Because he cares for you. That's a, that's a critically important point. That, 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 that particular sentence, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, it's actually a callback. One of the incredible things about Scripture, if, as, you, as you study Scripture, one of the things you'll show up is that themes, ideas, concepts, even similar phrasings will show up multiple times in Scripture. And this actually shows up multiple times. In, in Matthew 6, Jesus had said, hey, do not be anxious about your life. It's the same idea of casting all your anxieties on, on God. And in Psalm 55, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, it actually says in Psalm 55, cast your burden on the Lord. When something shows up multiple times in Scripture, it's like a flag waving to us, going, pay attention, this is important. And so when it says repeatedly in Scripture... Take your anxieties and cast them on the Lord. Why? Because he cares for them. He cares for you. It, it, it's a critical thing. And, and note, it doesn't say if 
you experience anxieties. And the scripture is saying, you're going to. And God is with you. God is Emmanuel, God with us in the middle of those anxieties and worries. So cast them on him. The next thing I want to encourage you to do in this season is this. Make room for the love of God to be the goal of my actions. The goal of my actions in this, in this Christmas season is, is the love of God being experienced by me and then being expressed to others. Right? That's the twofold experience of the love of God that I want to have. And, and really what that gets down to is us experiencing this, this phrase that's, that gets overused. The, the true meaning of Christmas. How, anybody in here, like, watch the Hallmark Christmas movies? I'm not going to, like, embarrass anybody at, or call you out. Okay. Kindred spirits, I watch them for different reasons. <laughs> so I, I drive my wife crazy with this. I will put on the Hallmark channel, hear me out, and the reason I do it is because I love predicting what's about to happen next. <laughs> because, let me tell you, it's shooting fish in a barrel. It's the easiest thing in, a, in the world. Right, if you haven't seen these things, okay, so it's Christmas, Hallmark Christmas movie. Um, you know, there's, she's a young attorney in the big city, and life is super busy, but her mom is sick in her hometown, so she has to go back to her hometown to, like, help her mom out and also balance the, the busy life. And there's a handyman. She went to high school with him. They weren't friends. He's working on the house to, like, build an extra room or whatever. He's a single dad. Did I mention that? He's got a daughter. She's in the Christmas pageant. But the Christmas pageant is about to be canceled. That's a disaster. They've got to save the whole thing. They're going to save Christmas. So anyway, so they work together, and it seems like the, the, the girl, the young attorney, she's busy, but she's realizing this guy she went to high school with, they, you know, they're kind of, there's some sparks there, and she really likes the little girl, and the little girl is like giving her real truths about her life that she needs to learn from. Anyway, so we all know this. So then the, the Christmas pageant comes, and like everything's falling apart, and then they work together. They save the Christmas pageant. They kiss on Christmas Eve as the snow falls, and then, and then you know, plot twist, her boyfriend from the big city, you know, who also works at the same law firm, he shows up. He's a jerk. None of us like him. And she has to ditch him. And then, and then she winds up with the handyman single father that now there's a romance. And then that's the end of the show because they, they learn the true meaning of Christmas is love and family and saving Christmas pageants in small towns, right? We all know that, like, that's, that's the real meaning of Christmas according to the Hallmark Channel. Here's the thing. I want to tell you very clearly. That is not the true meaning of Christmas, okay? First of all, any of you who, who watch those movies, you know that I am 100% right about everything I said. It's exactly how those movies go. That's why I like to watch them. I'm like, I guarantee that guy's a handyman and a single father. Yep, called it, right? But the true meaning of Christmas, the true meaning of Christmas is summarized in that single word from Isaiah 7, Emmanuel, God with us, that the Messiah, the Savior, has actually come to be with us, among us, to live with us, to experience life, fully human, fully God, to teach us the ways of, of God, and then to suffer and die for our sins on the cross and then be resurrected. Like, th that's, that's the meaning of Christmas. Like, the whole, you know, small town you know, Christmas pageant thing, it's fun to watch, but that's not what this is all about. What this is all about is this, this notion, God with us. He loves us that much. And so going back to this question, what if you and I said, hey, this Christmas... I want to experience that, and I want someone else to experience that through my actions. What if we said, okay, this week, this week, all I'm going to try to do, I'm, you know, i got to live my life, i got to do my job, i got to show up, you know, do all the stuff. But my goal for this week, I want to do two things. I want to create a space this week to experience the presence and the love of God. And the second thing I want to do is I want to do something that allows someone else to experience the love and the presence of God. What if we just did that this week? Just those two simple things. Do you think that that would change our experience of Christmas? I believe the answer is yes. Do you think that might change someone else's experience of Christmas? I, I think the answer is yes. Look at what it says in John chapter 13. It says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love and unselfish concern for one another. What if, what if we did that this week? And I'm not saying you got to save the world. Just one person 
Could we each do that? One person this week. And the, the last practice I want to encourage you to make time for is this. Make room to worship him. Uh, worship is not something that we just do here on Sunday mornings at church. Worship is an attitude of our heart. It's, it's this way of living in full awareness of who God is and how reliant we are on him. Um, I've, I've told this story here at, at Torrey Pines before, so I apologize if you've heard it. Um, but but I, I have a kind of a unique Christmas morning tradition I do every year uh, that involves worship. And here, here's what I do. On, on Christmas morning, I get up, get up at 4 a.m. And I, the reason I do that is not because I still have presents to wrap. Um, and it's not because I have little kids that have been, been up like since 3 a.m. Uh, my sons are in their 20s at this stage in, in their lives. Like they're not getting up at 4 a.m. unless there's a national emergency. So I'm up at 4 a.m. and the house is dark and the house is quiet. And I put on a little hot pot to make some tea and I turn on the lights in the Christmas tree and I light a candle and I light a fire in the fireplace because I'm a San Diego and if it's below 60, I'm going to get hypothermia. And I just sit in that moment of quiet. And then I put on some Christmas music. And it's, you know, it's not Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. It's not that Mariah Carey song that shall not be spoken of. It's, I actually, what I do is I listen to choral worship music. Because believe it or not, I love choral worship music. Because it's, it's, it's this timeless thing that goes across generations. And specifically, each year, I listen to the choir of Merton College from, from England. And they sing these beautiful hymns in Latin. And it, and it connects me to the timeless, eternal nature of God. And this song is always the first one that I play. And as I listen to it, it forces me to slow down. And I just sit in the quiet and I connect with God and I marvel at the fact that he chose to be with us. He chose to be Emmanuel. And then after a couple minutes, I, I read Luke chapter 2, which is one of the, the two gospel accounts that describes the birth of Jesus. And then I just sit. And then still in the quiet with the music playing, I do three things. The first thing I do is I thank God for everything he's done in my life this year. I thank him for how he's shown up for me, how he's shown up for my family, the, the surprises, the wonderful things, all the, all, the, all the great stuff. And then the second thing I do is I, I reflect back on all the hard stuff. The losses, the pains, the disappointments, the grief, sorrow, everything that broke, everything that went wrong, everything that hurts. And I thank God that in the middle of all of those things, he's been Emmanuel, God with me, in the middle of all of it. And then the third thing I do is I do an inventory. And I say, God, where have I fallen short? Where have I sinned? Where have I done wrong? And I repent, and I, and I apologize to God, and I say, I, forgive me. And then I just sit, and I experience the presence of God around me, with me, for me. And I want to invite you in, in this moment, for whatever time we've got, to, to just try to do that. To just take a moment. To know that God is with you, for you, in our midst. And I do want to say, 
in a room like this, there's always at least one person who goes, yeah, but not for me. That's probably for everybody else, but that's probably not for me. No, it's for you. It's for you. Isaiah 7 is God with you. No exceptions. Would you pray with me? Jesus, in the middle of this season of life being busy and hectic, but also, Jesus, in the middle of a, of a time where we can be deeply aware of our own sorrow and loss and pain, Jesus, we pray that we would be aware of your presence, that we would be aware that you are with us. We don't need to ask for you to be here because you're already here. And so, Lord, we pray that right now we would be aware of your presence. That you are here because you love us. And you are for us. So, Lord, we pray that we would be aware of that and we would embrace your presence. And even as life gets hectic and even as life sometimes gets painful, that we would know in the, bit, in the midst of the busyness, in the midst of the sorrow, you're still Emmanuel, God with us. So Jesus, right now we make room for your presence. Create space in our hearts. We ask that you would fill our hearts with an awareness of your presence. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.